Uh, good morning, everybody. So adult and general heart disease surgery surely conjures up images of a nice, relaxing, relaxing lifestyle. After all, surely we're just talking about pulmonary valve replacements and the odd sinus venosus defect, a nice, fishy, relaxing uh, life. But I, I'm going to convey some myths to you about this. First is that it's easy and straightforward. Um, I certainly don't find it easy and straightforward. I think some of it's extremely challenging. It's, it's definitely not all about sinus stenosis defects and tetralogy of fallow. It is certainly not just congenital heart disease in older people. These are fundamentally uh, different uh, lesions and different philosophies that you need in order to undertake this surgery. And the final uh, myth is that it's low risk. It absolutely isn't. And I'll uh, hopefully be able to uh, convince you of that. And this is the problem schematically. We all accept that risk is highest in the neonatal period and thereafter risk generally reduces across the board of congenital heart disease surgery. But what is probably completely underappreciated by most uh, folk in, in most heart centers is that thereafter the accumulation of uh, multiple revisions, myocardial fibrosis, arrhythmias, other end organ dysfunction, and infection means that risk gradually rises during early to mid adulthood, such that for the most complex uh, disease, anatomic disease category, uh, the class three diseases of uh, congenital heart disease, the median age of death is only 34 years and that is predominantly from heart failure, whereas for the more simple categories of congenital heart disease, the median age of death is in, in one's 70s and from malignancy. So it's this premature heart failure that is the problem, and I think it's actually the major, the major next goal for congenital heart disease as a, as a specialty uh, as a whole, is preventing premature death from heart failure. So this is a high-risk business. You need to keep your guard up. And even very well appearing adult and general heart disease patients have virtually no reserve inside because of this accumulation of reinterventions, fibrosis, etc. I'm going to start with a case study which is which typifies some of this. This is a 19-year-old girl uh, who uh, was in her first year of university at Queen's in Montreal. Uh, academic, academically very gifted lovely young lady, very vivacious and fun and likes the typical university student lifestyle and goes to the gym regularly. But she was born with hyperplastic left heart syndrome variant and had undergone a Yasui procedure with a 12 millimeter conduit as a, as a baby. And she was abruptly admitted with chest pain and decompensated right heart failure, having been prior, previously pretty well. On imaging, she had suprasystemic right ventricular uh, systolic pressures and she needed her conduit revision. The issue, though, is that on axial imaging, you can see she's got this hugely dilated DKS and this narrow conduit, and the DKS is almost invariably cemented to, plastered uh, to this reconstructed RV outflow tract and conduit. So this is a big deal, and this is the first message I want to get across. The, the stakes are extremely high for many ACHD patients, and by stakes, I mean it's different from risk. Operations can be high risk, but stakes really relates to how much that particular patient can lose. And for a 19 year old who's literally in the prime of her life at university and everything's great, the cost of a major life changing complication is absolutely huge for her. So thorough counseling is absolutely essential and the whole consent process takes a long time. And we call them 360 degree assessments, which I'll give an overview in a minute. So her case typifies much of what we do in adult and general heart disease surgery. It is basically major revision surgery. Occasionally we have virgin chests, but the vast majority of our cases are second, third or more redos. And, um, and uh, about a third are third, fourth, fifth or more uh, time re-stenotomy. And so therefore the sternal re-entry is absolutely key. The operation pretty much hinges, the conduct of the operation hinges on a clean re-entry. And you don't need to be a radiologist to realize that these are all very high risk re-entries. The video on the bottom left of the screen shows a conduit that is flat because it is plastered. It's being pushed against the sternal table. You can actually see the wire indentation marks. You are going to get inside that conduit. So you need to have a preemptive plan so that things are not urgent. And I, I try to uncomplicate everything. I just do it the same way every single time so that it's unexciting. 
and there are certain key things i i believe in i think you you should always do a bubble a bubble study um i do them religiously at the beginning of all redos because if they're negative you've got lots of options whereas if it's positive you have to be uh, wary of air even inadvertent injury to the right atrium can lead to catastrophic air embolism if you're not careful and air on the left side i'm watching continuously by tee you need to be you need to be ready to fibrillate the heart or cross clamp the aorta the minute you see it uh, i have a very low threshold for peripheral cannulation because the stakes are so high you cannot afford uh, a a, re a re entry related injury in a case like the the, the one i just presented um, so I have a very low threshold for peripheral cannulation and I use chimney grafts on the artery to protect the distal limb. I always use a seven millimeter Dacron graft with a 22 EOPA inside it and uh, almost invariably a 29 French femoral venous uh, in the uh, femoral vein. And usually we get great drainage with that. Continuous TE monitoring. I, I have a very old school fibrillator ready and it can really get you out of trouble because if there's any air on the left side, fibrillate the heart immediately to minimize the risk of air embolism. Um, I generally cool to about 28 degrees for a big re-entry because this gives lots of options. You can then shut the pump off for five, six, seven, eight minutes, really without any uh, in, any great bother um, to open and repair uh, under circ arrest or low flow. If I'm really worried, I'll cool further. And I use lots of retractors. I love the Favaloro retractor. It, it takes the assistant out of the equation and you can dissect it long distance under the sternal table with it. So um, bypass support, I mentioned peripheral cannulation. Uh, femoral artery, femoral vessels are great. Often ACHD patients do have small vessels though, and they may be occluded. So other sites can be very helpful. Increasingly, I now use the axillary artery. I find that very helpful inflow and it also gives options for things like percutaneous uh, impeller vads uh, if uh, if functions poor at the end of big cases and occasionally the jugular vessels if needed if you're having trouble with venous drainage uh, an ij cannula can can really help so protecting the heart is absolutely essential and i take it very very seriously i give tons of cardioplegia i give it every 40 minutes i'm using del nido um, and if I'm concerned, I'll give retrograde as well. And increasingly, I actually cool to moderate hypothermia, pr predominantly for myocardial arrest to prevent the heart warming up. And by taking this sort of uh, uh, meticulous attention to this, it is very rare that we have unexpected, important ventricular dysfunction at the end of even very long cases. So we really look after the heart because if you've got good function at the end, you're almost always going to be fine. Getting control of the aorta, though, is can be a major, major problem in ACHD cases, particularly the case I presented. Um, that aorta is 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 the DKS is huge. It's going to be thin walled, and it will be plastered to that conduit, and it can be very difficult or even unsafe to get around. And so again, I just uncomplicate the whole process, and and very frequently. If things are stuck, I just go through this same process. I cool down to 28 degrees, pace the patient very steeply, head down, fibrillate the heart, shut the pump off, and literally just cut straight across the aorta. In fact, you don't have to have anything dissected out. You can just cut anteriorly into the aorta and find the luminal inside of the aorta rather than having to dissect around it. And having transected it, you can quickly free up a posterior cuff uh, of the um, distal, uh, the distal cut end of the aorta to get a clamp on, or quickly over sew it with two layers of 3O proline as like a pseudo clamp, and then de air the arch and restart the pump. And that's usually five, six, seven minutes of arrest only. And I've never seen any uh, neurologic injury as a result of that. And I do it frequently. And it saves you a whole bunch of time and, um, uh, and uh, risk. Then is the main bulk of the operation, reconstructing and implanting devices and so on and so forth. And then we move into the weaning from bypass and assessment. And um, the first mantra of, of mine is that you have to have lines that you really believe. And it, it amazes me the number of times I see people coming off pump having not zeroed their lines or they're not quite sure whether they believe it. Or And uh, 
I think you have to have lines you believe. So um, if if the radial arterial line isn't reliable, place a femoral arterial line. Always zero all your lines in the field uh, so that you believe them. Uh, very low threshold for intracardiac right or left atrial lines. Um, and we may well float PA catheters, etc. cetera. Um, I use epicardial echo in every single case. It gives great, it gives me immediate answers. I think the pictures are better than TE. Dare I say it, it means I'm not dependent on an echo team. And for certain structures, it really is far superior. Coronaries I can clear really straight away and you have peace of mind after bentle switches, things like that. And then we move into hemostasis and stabilization. And for the anesthetist here, please, please don't be shy with blood products. Um, we need to get these patients absolutely dry. And so after big cases, we give what we call the kitchen sink, which is se sequentially going through every type of product um, necessary until until things are dry. And this whole surgical versus medical bleeding, I just it, it, I just disregard it. It's all surgical. It, patient's bleeding because you're doing surgery, so it is surgical bleeding. But even proper surgical bleeding will stop with time, pressure, and blood products. So don't be shy with the products. And once you think it's dry, I wait even longer in the operating room um, because um, the risk of the the uh, um, uh, the prevalence of reopening for bleeding should be exceedingly low. But furthermore, because the operating room simply is the best intensive care. So an extra hour or two in the operating room is not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. You have anesthetists, surgeons, et cetera, literally one, watching minute by minute every slight change in every parameter and reacting to it. It is the best intensive care in a hospital. Thereafter, um we firmly believe in early extubation it really does help in many uh, respects getting patients moving and uh, there's extensive now literature in the adult cardiac surgi surgical realm that early extubation is is better and so we set our patients up for either extubation in the operating room or very shortly after so we use a lot of regional blocks which uh, we find to be very very helpful and with these strategies, a half of all of our ACHD cases are extubated in the operating room, and a whole bunch thereafter are extubated in the few hours after, with a very low reintubation rate, which is almost always from persistent anesthesia rather than uh, cardiopulmonary failure. Um, and it's not just it's not just straightforward cases. We extubate Rosses, redo Bentles, and conduits, and uh, even Fontan revisions sometimes in the operating room. And, and even those chronic ICU patients, the picture on the top right is an ICU patient who is uh, being mobilized even with an ET, ET tube in place, believe it or not. So I guess our philosophy, you would say, is really get patients moving as fast as possible and early extubation helps in that. So having set that scene, this is a picture of, of our practice in terms of the AHA anatomic disease categories of ACHD, uh, a third of our patients are in the most complex anatomic category and about 40% are in the most decompensated area, i.e. most big tertiary level ACHD programs. The case mix now is really very complicated and decompensated. And indeed, you can see that up to 40% of our patients are urgent inpatient cases rather than elective cases. A quarter is heart failure surgery, a lot of single ventricle surgery, and unfortunately, a lot of endocarditis, the, um, the dread of ACHD programs, because uh, it really is a multi-organ uh, uh, disease, uh, which is a, an extremely strong risk factor for death in all uh, models. And talking about models, there are very few risk prediction scores for adult congenital heart disease. There are some crude ones that we've tried to generate with the STS and so on and so forth, but they are extremely crude. Um, probably the best one we have at the moment is from the Royal Brompton in London. It's the PEACH score, which combines a bunch of anatomic and also uh, sort of clinical physiologic parameters to uh, create a, a, a prediction model, which has then actually been validated in a completely separate large ACHD program in Europe. Um, uh, and 
we're very familiar with sort of risk stratification in the pediatric realm. You know, stat category is a part of our vernacular, and we all accept that stat five cases are the most complex um, with the highest predicted risk of 14%. But these stat five cases, they only take up about four or 5% of even really big pediatric heart center practices. I think one of the biggest knowledge gaps relating to adult congenital heart disease uh, surgery is that when we apply PEACH score risk prediction models to our ACHD cases, a quarter, not 5%, but a quarter of all of our cases are in the highest risk predicted mortality, 17% predicted mortality, which is higher than STAT5 cases. It is completely underappreciated, I believe, that in big practices, ACHD surgery is actually a much higher risk entity than pediatric practices. Um, and teams need to digest that and, and accept it, and, uh, and it can be difficult for them to do so. Having said that, with all the strategies that I've mentioned, I think you can contain risk, and certainly we think we're doing a good job here operating at, at a... Um, a mortality rate of uh, less than 2%. And even if we look at non-mortality outcomes, I think they're very favorable, whether it's peri uh, post-cardiotomy, ECMO, tracheostomy rates, incidentally, none of these have gone home with a trach. These are just temporary tracheostomies, permanent stroke, fasciotomies, et cetera. And in fact, all our patients, we, we follow up post-discharge and at three years, we have a 97% survival rate, which I think is extremely favorable for ACHD practice. So far from being a nice cushy life, I think this picture really represents what adult congenital heart disease surgical practice in the real world looks like if you're treating patients in a major center dealing with decompensated heart failure and end-stage single ventricle disease and endocarditis and things like that. I'm going to finish off with a case that really typifies this. It was a case we did uh, about a month or six weeks ago. Um, and he exemplifies much of what I've said. He's born with Tetralogy of Fallow, and he's seven, 47 years old now. And Tetralogy of Fallow sounds like you know, a nice, benign, straightforward, low-risk condition, doesn't it? Uh, but it's not in adulthood when you end up with heart failure. Um, he'd had a repair many, many years ago. He then actually had outflow tract reconstructions with Kono patches in a sort of form of Kono type Rostelli patch. It had VT with ablations and had an ICD in place. And then, like many of our patients, he was lost with very poor follow up until he represented now with endocarditis and decompensated heart failure with very severe RV outflow tract obstruction, uh, systemic RV pressures, severe tricuspid regurgitation, and at least moderate or moderate to severe RV dysfunction. But tetralogy of fallow is not just a right-sided disease. He also had severe left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, moderate mitral regurgitation, moderate aortic insufficiency, and low normal LV function. So both left and right-sided disease affecting both outflow tracts and all four valves. In addition, he was obese with acute on chronic renal failure and had a 50% LAD stenosis. So this is the approach we take for these very complicated patients. I think the pre-op workup is absolutely essential for identifying, containing, and mitigating risk. And so our journey starts with a thorough ACHD conference, which is very well participated, uh, very well uh, attended. It incorporates the breadth and depth of the entire heart center expertise of, across all the dis disciplines. Many non-cardiology consult um, physicians will attend. And the outcome of that then leads to a pre-op workup. And I think a key part of this is what we call the 360 degree assessment, where patients are seen from all sorts of different angles, a bit like a transplant assessment, all trying to identify risk and areas we can pre-operatively optimize things. That's separate from specific surgical consults, but all along this, the patient is receiving counseling from everybody to become fully educated about their risk level and the expected journey. And finally, the decision to proceed is a joint one. It's collective ownership. Um, and I think that's some of the key, anesthesia and ICU and 
they're collectively involved in the decision making the the risk tolerance is is um collectively owned by everybody and finally we concentrate on optimizing the patient to get them in the best best possible shape before we proceed and i think it is essential to have the right team and that includes everybody in the perioperative team perfusion anesthesia icu and it, it should be sort of an achd familiar group rather than just anybody who's on the schedule that day we then get on with the case itself and the case typified much of what I said. The aorta is plastered to the manubrium. We exposed the femoral vessels. We went on, but fem bypassed to 30 degrees, intentionally fibrillated the heart. I didn't have to circa rest, but often what you can do is on bypass, you can drop the flow way, way, way down, and it just decompresses the aorta and lets it fall away from the sternum such that you can then develop a safe plane between the periosteum and then just bring the flow back up once you're safely in and then once we're in the chest we then centrally cannulate and make sure the leg is reperfused and this is what we need to do we need to essentially take out both outflow tracts the septum which needs to be reconstructed um, the aorta was dilated and aneurysmal so both outflows but of course both inflow valves are also affected the tricuspid and mitral valves uh, are, are both affected as well and this is what we're looking at um, uh, with things open this is the rv outflow tract opened and you can see all this solid calcific calcific material it is completely solid and to get this material out you need literally orthopedic instruments with this rv outflow tract open this is that rostelli type cono uh, patch that had been previously used to augment the outflow tract and this is totally solid and separate from a perimembranous vsd patch which is also totally solid um, this is calcified aortic valve and here again another view this is that cono patch the rv outflow tract is open we're looking into the right ventricle and a calcified and infected icd lead is seen in the trabeculations of the right ventricle we're now Having resected that cono patch, you can see these hard lumps or rocks of calcium that we all have to be debrided. You can't possibly sew to this. The point is, once you take out this patch, you've got to start all over again and uh, uh, cut back until you've got healthy muscle. This sponge is in the left ventricular cavity. This is the right ventricular cavity, and this is the border of the septum with that calcified material. And having removed, uh, having removed this. Um, the septum and, and now we've got to reconstruct things this is the rv outflow tract and the lv outflow tract we are reconstructing with a, a handmade composite graph that i've made up with a tissue valve inside a dacron conduit such that this tongue below is going to be used to reconstruct the ventricular septum and then this will be a tissue bental conduit and this is what we're, we're parachuting it down now this is a schematic picture of what we're doing this is the RV outflow tract opened. The ventricular septum is open. So we're looking into the left ventricle here. And then this tissue composite bental graft to reconstruct all of the LV outflow tract. And then we're going to reconstruct the RV outflow tract jumping over the top, which in this case was a very unusual one. And we had to use a, a collection of things. This is a, this is the uh rv out the new rv outflow tract conduit this is actually some bovine pericardium to help reconstruct the infundibulum and then we come off bypass after a long clamp time of just over five hours long bypass run time but meticulous attention to myocardial protection and the function is pretty good i can immediately clear the coronaries the left main is wide open this is all by epicardial echo we can get good views through the uh, rv outflow tract and the uh the uh bioprosthetic valve that i've used and uh and that we wean off by bypass on pretty reasonable doses of inotropes excellent perfusion completely even flu fluid balance on pump with the highest lactate of 2.6 really very good and then we stay a long time in the operating room ensuring hemostasis and stability as i said it's the safest place to be so this is what it's really like being an ACHD surgeon. You creep in late at night after these massive cases. Um, but I think time in the operating room is very well spent. 
And <clears throat> the post-op recovery, we focus on trying to get him extubated really fast. And we did within 30 hours, he was extubated, but he was awake and interacting long before that, managing vasoplegia. The best way to manage vasoplegia is extubate the patient and their, their tone will come back um, as soon as you do. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna leave you, these are all the sort of various vignettes that I highlighted uh, during my talk. Um, uh, thank you very much.